The ritual had worked. The sorceress was immortal at last. Little did she know, in a far-off realm of existence, her immortality was the topic of conversation. Hello everybody and welcome to Monster of the Week. This week we're talking about inevitables. We're going to talk about what they are, how they behave, how they fight, some possible plot hooks, and as always, some modifications. So what are inevitables? Inevitables are constructs from the plane of law, mechanis, and they exist to uphold the inevitable laws of the universe. They can be found in several editions of D&D, but they are prominently featured in 3.5. So what universal laws do they uphold? They uphold the law of the oath, that every contract inevitably must be fulfilled, the law of death, that every creature inevitably must die, the law of justice, that all creatures inevitably must answer for their crimes, the law of space and time, that there is an inevitable flow to the universe, and the law of mortality, that the gods are inevitably superior. Each kind of inevitable is very different, and they are all created for the sole purpose of upholding one of these laws. When someone breaks one of these laws in the mortal world, it is inevitable that an inevitable will come after them. Once one of these constructs has been assigned a target, nothing can deter them. There have been stories of people trying to escape inevitable by going to a different continent, only for the inevitable to walk directly into the sea and appear on the other continent months later. They often don't notice anyone aside from their target unless they're relevant to completing their goal, and ultimately they're utterly relentless in the pursuit of their target. So let's discuss the different kinds of inevitables, which laws they uphold, and how they uphold those laws. I'm going to preface this part by saying, please forgive my pronunciation. Since these names are written in a book, I'm not sure exactly how they're supposed to be pronounced, and I'm sure my Eastern Canadian accent's not going to help anything. But nonetheless, first up we have the Koyurut. The Koyuruts are created to uphold the law of oath. They seek those who would purposefully break oaths or contracts they have made. Most Koyurets are sent to the material plane initially because of some great betrayal or misdeed. However, once here, they will hunt down anyone from army deserters to sketchy merchants. They are by far the most human of their kind, and therefore the most personable. There have been records of them even attempting niceties and introductions when it's appropriate. When they are made aware of a new target, they will gather as much information about the contract or deal that was broken, oftentimes getting a physical copy in writing of the agreement. It also spends time studying the target. That way it can know what to expect should a fight break out. They will try to make the target fulfill their end of the contract, but if there's no way to fulfill their end of the contract or the target is unwilling, the sentence is almost always death. It has several abilities which can assist in the hunt. It can use Disguise Self to go undercover should that be necessary, and it can cast Invisibility so that it can get close to its target without being detected. Its favorite strategy is to use Invisibility, get close to its target, and then weaken it with its Vampiric Touch ability. It can also cast Enervation Ray to weaken its target with negative levels. This is most likely to happen if the Koyuret can't force its target to comply with the contract right away. Koyurets, like all inevitables, are relentless in their pursuit, which makes them a great stumbling block to throw at a party who has abandoned one of their previous agreements with an NPC. Maybe they've been traveling with a merchant who has a bit of a shady past that they're only now becoming aware of. It would not be much of a stretch for a guild to use Koyurets. Should they provide the Koyuret with details of a contract breaker, they will more than happily go after the target. After all, this is their sole purpose. Next up, and my personal favorite, we have the Marut. Maruts enforce the inevitability of death. Yeah. They hunt down those who artificially enhance their lifespan, such as liches or powerful wizards. They are humanoid, but they do not look human. They are massive creatures adorned with golden plate armor and obsidian black skin. They carry no other equipment with them, and thus are often underestimated by powerful spellcasters. When a Marut identifies its target, it marches in a beeline straight towards them, not letting anything get in its way, never resting until the job is done. When it finds its target, a Marut's typical tactic is to close off any exits with a wall of force, and then it uses chain lightning to start dealing damage to its target while it closes the distance. Once the Marut is within striking distance, it uses its massive fist to pummel its target, thus activating its ability Fists of Thunder and Lightning. But we can spell casters with repeated use of Greater Dispel, and should a target attempt to flee, it can cast Dimension Door to close in on them. But let's back up for a second. Fists of Thunder and Lightning? That sounds like a horrifying ability you might say. Well, it is. The Thunder and Lightning quality of its fists are meant to weaken and incapacitate its foes. The left fist delivers a thunderclap, dealing sonic damage and on a failed save deafens the target for anywhere from 2 to 12 rounds. Its right fist delivers a flash of lightning, which on a failed save will cause the target to be blinded for 2 to 12 rounds. Its other spells and abilities such as True Seeing and Plane Shift, its other spells such as True Seeing or Plane Shift are meant to help it hunt down magical opponents. After all, those who would cheat death frequently do so with magical means. An encounter with a Marut can be a very intense experience, especially because if you throw one of these at your party, the target will know why, and they'll know that it's their fault. Should they survive the first encounter, with a Marut, 
It can make for an interesting turn of events when the party realizes a second one will be on its way. Maybe they'll choose to prepare and take on the Moruts one after another as they come. Or maybe there's something in your world they can do to stop the Moruts from coming after them. As creatures of pure law, they're not necessarily the bad guys either though. A Marut could also serve as a plot hook. If the Marut's not after the players, maybe it seeks their help in defeating an evil necromancer nearby. No matter how you choose to use the Marut, it will surely be a memorable encounter. Next we have the Zelikut. The Zelikut is basically a clockwork centaur. They are constructed to hunt down those who have denied justice, especially if the target's on the run to escape punishment. They're expert trackers and will hunt down fugitives wherever they hide. They're also very fast, so good luck outrunning one of these guys. At first glance, they may not appear too threatening, but as a free action, they can produce two spiked chains from their forearms and a pair of golden wings from their back. They often conceal these hidden traits as to not draw too much attention to themselves, but once the time is right for them to take down their target, they'll hold nothing back. However, more than any of their brethren, they are concerned with innocent bystanders. No inevitable would ever purposely harm an innocent creature. However, Zelikuts will take extra precaution to make sure no innocents are harmed when they apprehend the target. If the sentence the target has escaped is death, the Zelikut will quickly execute its target with no pageantry or fanfare. It simply kills the creature and moves on. If the sentence is not death or is yet to be determined, the target is simply bound in spiked chains and returned to the proper authority. Often, if your players are in a big city and they see one of these creatures chasing after a man who seems to be running for his life, they may assume the creature's some sort of monster and the man is innocent. This could create an interesting encounter once the players realize what's actually going on. Alternatively, these creatures are not infallible, so it could be possible for one of these creatures to gather misinformation from an enemy of the party. The Zelikut would then hunt down the party thinking they were avoiding justice, only to eventually realize that the one who sent them after the party is in fact the one avoiding justice. But of course, that would count on the party talking to their enemy instead of just killing them. But if the party does try to talk to the construct, it could provide some information about an enemy who they may not even know about. So, we've covered all the inevitables that are in the Monster Manual. However, there are two other inevitables published in the Fiend Folio. They are much more dangerous and protect laws only the most powerful beings could break. First, we have the Quarut. Quaruts protect two of the most important laws and are considered invaluable by their brethren. They protect the laws of space and time. They are created with an infallible sense of spatial and temporal awareness. They know almost immediately when someone has disturbed the space-time continuum, and they won't hesitate to begin their hunt for the transgressors. They are made of extremely fine metal and seem to be etched with many rules runes involving time. Their heads appear sort of as a hollow helmet, containing a golden hourglass which has sand constantly flowing down through it. Occasionally the sand flows up through the hourglass, although no mortal has ever received an answer as to why. They're most concerned with spellcasters who use spells such as Wish, Temporal Stasis, Time Stop, or any other spell that has the potential to upset the balance of the universe. In their mind, these spells are all risks to the beings who inhabit the universe, and they play havoc with the laws of reality. Despite the fact that they see these spells as a risk, they believe that their understanding of the universe is so vast and superior to any mortal that they can use this type of magic with impunity. In fact, they will often use temporal stasis to imprison the offender in a bubble of null time, thus ending the fight as soon as possible. In addition to temporal stasis, they have access to abilities such as Wish and Force Cage to get around anyone who might have immunities to temporal stasis for one reason or another. If any of your players loves to use one of the spells I mentioned before to get out of situations, they may find out they have a Karut on their trail. Or perhaps a Karut has malfunctioned and its sense of the space-time continuum has been distorted. Maybe for reasons no one else can understand, it has targeted a small village and decides that it must be destroyed as it shouldn't exist. A situation like that could set one of these guys up for an interesting adventure night, or you could even make him the main villain of a small campaign. Ultimately, when space and time are involved, there's almost always a good reason to get one of these guys in your game. They're very interesting and will have your players asking lots of questions. The other inevitable found in the Fiend Folio is the Veracoot. Veracoots are the most powerful form of inevitable. They have to be, since they hunt a prey more dangerous than any other mortal. Veracoots hunt down those who would try to attain godhood by usurping the gods themselves. They are defenders of the gods, divine, infernal, and everything in between. They worship no gods themselves, nor do they have an allegiance to any particular god. They simply understand the necessity for divine beings and understand that a usurper could bring chaos to the universe. They are built to be ultimate destroyers and challenge any mortal who would try to face the gods. They almost always start their attack with a dispelling blast, which functions as greater dispel, except it targets an area. After disabling some of their foes' abilities or items, they will cast spells such as Wish or Meteor Storm to do great amounts of damage. Once they feel their target is weak enough, they will close in and finish the job with their hands if they have to. Unlike the other Inevitables, the sentence from a Veracoot is always death. A being who possesses such power that it would potentially usurp the gods cannot be allowed to live. Veracoots make excellent enemies for any campaign that focuses around bringing down a god. Whether it's a good god or an evil god the party is after, whether their deeds are ultimately for the greater good of mankind, Veracoots will be there to stop them. One last thing worth mentioning, and this goes for all Inevitables, they all have access to the spell Find Person, Hold Person, and a few other complementary spells that focus around locating their target and then tracking them. It goes without 
saying that these spells would be invaluable to any inevitable. Now, there is one final inevitable that we have yet to talk about. The reason we haven't talked about this one and I don't include it with the others is because this inevitable is kind of out of place. It doesn't really seem to fit with the others. And honestly, it strikes me as something that was just kind of tacked onto the adventure supplement and for some reason was grouped with the inevitables. I'm talking about the Waste Crawler or Anhedrut. The Waste Crawler comes from the book Sandstorm, which is a third edition supplement. It's basically a giant metal scorpion tank. Now, according to the book, they exist to preserve the natural order of the desert and the inevitable law of the waste. They punish all who would go against the law of the desert, which could mean anyone who's just trying to farm in the desert, or irrigating the desert, or maybe even a trade post that just grows too large. Honestly, compared to the other inevitables, they're fairly unimpressive and not that interesting. They do have one ability that I find fascinating though, and that's that they can cast the spell Global Warming. Global Warming is an epic level spell that raises the temperature of a massive area by one category. They can only use it once every 100 years, and it is kind of a cool ability. I just like the idea that these guys have the ability to form a new desert in an area that that's already fairly warm. The reason I don't think these guys are completely useless is because they kind of set up a neat idea that there are inevitables for certain biomes. So if I was going to put one of these in my game in the desert, I would also have a different one in the nearby forest, one in the mountains, each with its own unique abilities that kind of represent the environment they're in. There could even be one that upholds the law of the inevitable rise of civilization. I still think the inevitability of the desert waste or any environment for that matter is kind of a loose tie-in and I don't know if they really belong with the others, but like anything, they're as interesting as you want to make them. It could make for an interesting adventure setting, a world where all the inevitables are battling it out for the superiority of their own biome. It would just be a war of really hardcore mechanical druids, except they're not really seeking to preserve nature, just their version of nature. I don't know, could be interesting. But yeah, I'm not going to go too much further into these guys, just wanted to mention that they exist, and maybe that'll give you some ideas for how to make them more interesting. Anyways, that's all for today. Hopefully you enjoyed the discussion, and I hope that you can find a use for these super lawyers in your game. If you think it's inevitable that you'll want to watch more Monster of the Week, please subscribe, a new one comes out every week and I'd love to see some comments below about your experience with inevitables or any plans you have to use them in your game. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next week.